All right, we're now going to examine Kingdom Protista. Kingdom Protista. And uh, we might ask, uh, how would we define the members of Kingdom Protista? So in fact, uh, we wrote right here, there are over 50,000 species of them, and they are all unicellular, meaning single-celled uh, organisms. But unlike Kingdom Monera, all of these organisms possess a nucleus. They are eukaryotes. Now, the way they reproduce is simply by mitosis or binary fission. The, uh, we're going to divide the Kingdom Protista into uh, a number of phyla. And uh, let me summarize where we're going with this by having us look at this chart. In this uh, simplified scheme, uh, all the members of Kingdom Protista are single-celled and possess a nucleus. These are much larger cells and much more complex cells than those found uh, making up uh, the organisms in Kingdom Monera. Uh, we're going to divide Kingdom Protista into three phylum. Uh, phylum protozoa, phylum diatoms, and phylum dinoflagellates. And uh, in the case of phylum protozoa, we're going to further subdivide those into four classes. <clears throat> now, um, uh, what we're going to see with many of these uh, or, uh, single-celled organisms in Kingdom Protista is that many of them have symbiotic relationships with other types of organisms. Uh, and uh, so let's talk about symbiosis. This is a term that's written at the bottom of page J1. So on the very bottom of page J1, we mention symbiotic relationships. Symbiosis is made up of two Greek roots, sim meaning together, and bio meaning life or living, living together. And this is when two different kinds of organisms, two species, uh, live together. And it may be a beneficial relationship or a adversarial or destructive relationship. Uh, let's take a look at three types of symbiotic relationships. This is on page J2. J2. And uh, actually, the first type of symbiotic relationship I'd like to examine is the second one that's listed called mutualism. In, a, in mutualism, or a mutualistic symbiotic relationship, it is what I refer to as a win-win relationship, which I represented by drawing two plus signs. This is where both species benefit from this relationship. So let's give you a few examples of this. Uh, the one that I've, uh, I've actually described here as a, uh, symbiotic, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship is the relationship between the remora fish and sharks. Now, sharks are very uh, aggressive uh, uh, feeders and eaters. They're also very sloppy the way they eat. They rip apart their food. They get food thrown all over. Interestingly, there are these small fish called remora, which the shark does not attack. And these remora fish uh, simply uh, move along the surface of the shark's body and they feed on all the bits of food that are on the shark's body. Now, in this symbiotic relationship, uh, both species benefit. Uh, what the shark gets out of this relationship is it gets itself cleaned off by these remora fish. What the remora fish get out of the relationship is free food. So this is a win-win relationship, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. Another example, uh, I didn't uh, show it here in this picture, but another example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship is that between flowering plants and honeybees. So uh, everybody's familiar with this. Uh, the honeybees act to uh, pollinate or uh, uh, flowering plants, and that really is the mo mechanism by which flowering plants are able to reproduce. So without these honeybees, flowering plants would not be able to reproduce. What do the bees get out of this relationship? They get free food in the form of nectar. So they collect the nectar from the flowers uh, from which they make honey. And uh, in the process of collecting nectar, uh, the diff uh, flowering plants get pollinated, and that's how they reproduce. Now, uh, another type of relationship is shown on page J3 is parasitism. 
In parasitism, it's what I call a win-lose or a plus-minus symbiotic relationship. This is where one species benefits at the expense of the other species. And um, there are many examples of this. Uh, the, uh, we've already previously learned about some bacteria uh, that uh, feed on humans and other living things. And as they feed on humans, they injure the human, uh, causing them to get sick. Uh, and obviously, these uh, bacteria benefit from the relationship. Those were called parasitic uh, uh, bacteria that are responsible for uh, uh, diseases, uh, pathogenic parasitic bacteria. Uh, we're going to be giving you examples of uh, other parasitic relationships uh, in kingdom protista with other living things, including us. Now, uh, the very first type of symbiotic relationship back on page J2 is called commensalism, or a commensalistic symbiotic relationship. This is what I call a, uh, a win-zero relationship, a plus-zero relationship. This is where one species benefits, and the other species does, isn't really benefited, nor is it, does it appear to be truly harmed. Now, the example that I gave you of a commensalistic symbiotic relationship on page J2 was the relationship between uh, whales and barnacles that become attached to the surface of the whale. Now, uh, barnacles are a type of shrimp that uh, do not move. They uh, are contained within a calcareous cone, uh, a, a cone made out of calcium carbonate. And uh, they, uh, obviously, they don't move, so they, but yet they still need food. They uh, at, at, attach themselves to the surface of the whale, and as the whale swims through the water, these barnacles, or shrimp-like organisms, are able to gather the food that they need. And uh, it doesn't seem to uh, harm the whales uh, in, in any way, having these barnacles attached. So the whales do not seem to be harmed, nor do they seem to have any benefit from the presence of these barnacles, but the barnacles benefit from the relationship. So this is known as a win-zero or neutral relationship. There are many examples of these. Uh, let me uh, give you three examples relating to bacteria, which we've already talked about in Kingdom Monera. There are bacteria that live in our body, including in our mouth. Some of these bacteria that live in our body are actually beneficial. Some bacteria that live in us, uh, including lactobacillus, which we talked about last time, which is uh, responsible for breaking apart lactose sugar uh, into uh, lactic acid, is a beneficial bacteria, especially if somebody is uh, lactose intolerant and cannot break down or digest the, nat the lactose that's naturally found in dairy products. So this bacteria living in your intestinal tract helps you break down lactose that's in dairy products. We also have other bacteria that live in our uh, intestines that uh, break down various types of foods that we're not able to digest, providing additional vitamins, uh, making them available to us. Uh, there are uh, also living in our body uh, bacteria that are commensalistic, that have a commensalistic relationship with us. Uh, they don't seem to uh, benefit us, but they also don't seem to harm us. Uh, so there are commensalistic bacteria. And, of course, there are parasitic bacteria that cause us to get sick. So the, uh, we're going to use these three types of symbiotic relationships as we describe uh, members of Kingdom Protista. All right, so uh, the first, uh, looking at our overall scheme here, uh, the first phylum uh, in Kingdom Protista uh, that we're going to talk about are phylum protozoa. Now, uh, the word protozoa literally means first animal, zoa, like zoology. So these are animal-like in nature in the sense that they feed on other things. They are heterotrophs, literally to feed on other things. They do not make their own food by photosynthesis. Now, we're further going to uh, classify or categorize uh, the protozoans uh, into four classes based on their motility. Motility means how they move. And uh, these four classes we're going to call class amoeba, which moves by means of what are called pseudopodia, or false feet. Uh, class trypanosoma, 
which move by means of flagella, tail, a tail-like structure that uh, moves. The third class, class paramecium, are uh, protozoans that move by means of little hairs, motile hairs called cilia. And the fourth class of protozoans, class plasmodium, uh, are non-motile. They don't move at all. I might just mention, uh, and I've written it here, a very important member of uh, class plasmodium uh, is the uh, protozoan that causes malaria. Uh, and in fact, all of the members in class plasmodium are parasites. Since they cannot move, they feed on wherever they are. And uh, if they happen to be in you, they're feeding on you. So uh, all the members of class plasmodium are parasites. We're going to go through each of these uh, uh, classes of protozoans right now, and then we'll return back to examining these two other phylum of uh, kingdom protista, the diatoms, and the dinoflagellates. So uh, let's first uh, take a look at page uh, J4. On J4, so uh, we'll speak of class amoeba. And an amoeba is a single-celled organism that's like the original blob. And uh, they live in freshwater ponds. And you can see they do have a nucleus and many other internal organelles. And they move by means of pseudopodia, where there is cytoplasmic streaming. And they kind of extend out this false foot, which is what pseudopod or pseudopodia means. Uh, pseudo means false, pod, as in the word podiatrist, a false foot, and they just kind of extend them out, and the cytoplasm streams in, and next thing you know, it's moved to a different place. Now, uh, how do these, uh, what do these amoeba usually feed on? They feed on bits of food in pond water, and uh, they simply extend their pseudopods out, and they carry on phagocytosis. They swallow up something forming a food vacuole around whatever they swallowed up, taken up within them. Now, uh, since the amoeba live in freshwater ponds, that creates a, a very significant problem for them. And the problem has to do with the prob uh, problem of osmosis. <clears throat> Let's take a look at page J5 to help us understand this. So in this picture on J5, so we have the amoeba, and we know that the cytoplasm inside all cells is about 80% water. And that's what we've written here, 80% water. But the amoeba lives in pond water, which is effectively 100% water. So since the amoeba lives in an environment that's 100% water, and the inside of the amoeba is only 80% water, there's a difference in concentration of water between the, what's outside the cell and what's inside. So water tends to diffuse or flow into the amoeba, flowing from an area of higher concentration of water to an area of lower concentration of water inside the amoeba. Anytime water diffuses either into a cell or out of a cell, that's called osmosis. So what we have is osmosis occurring. But as this water continues to flow into this amoeba, the amoeba is going to start to swell up more and more. And if something doesn't compensate or correct for this accumulation of water inside the amoeba, the amoeba will burst. Well, that would not be a very good design for an organism that lives in pond water where the water just flows into it and it swells up and blows up. So in fact, uh, the amoeba, as well as all other freshwater protozoans, have a special adaptation, something called a contractile vacuole. The purpose of the contractile vacuole is that as the water diffuses into the amoeba, the water accumulates or is collected in this membranous sac or vacuole called a contractile vacuole. And once that uh, vacuole becomes filled with enough water, it does exactly what its name says. That contractile vacuole contracts, and it squirts out the excess water back out into the pond. So because it's constantly able to uh, eliminate the excess water that's flowing into the amoeba, that prevents it from swelling up and 
bursting. So uh, that's it. what I've just described. Uh, we've written right here, right below the picture, that uh, all freshwater protozoans, such as the amoeba, uh, have this contractile vacuole. <clears throat> now we ask the question, do you think a protozoan that lived in ocean water would need a contractile vacuole? So if you think about it, if, it's lives, if it, you have a single-celled uh, protozoan living in very salty environment, if anything, the water inside will start to diffuse out of the amoeba uh, or the protozoan rather than flowing in. So if anything, uh, it wouldn't need a contractile vacuole to hold additional water and squirt it out. It would actually have to constantly take up additional water to prevent it from uh, undergoing crenation and collapsing as the water would be drawn out of the uh, amoeba or out of the protozoan due to the salty ocean water. So the answer is no. Protozoans that live in ocean water do not need a contractile vacuum at all. They actually have the opposite problem. They have to constantly uh, take in additional water. Now, most amoeba are pretty friendly guys that just feed on bits of food in pond water, but uh, there is a, an amoeba, one of the species of amoebas, that uh, is a pathogenic parasite in us. It's uh, called Entamoeba histolytica. Uh, you don't have to know the scientific name, just understand that there is an amoeba that uh, lives in our intestinal tract and it causes a disease known as amoebic dysentery. Now, uh, it, what this amoeba does when it's uh, in our intestinal tract is it feeds on the inside wall of the intestine, creating uh, diarrhea and a bloody stool as it injures the inner wall of the intestine. Uh, now, uh, you might ask, well, how, where, does this, uh, where do you find this amoeba in the water? And so we find this amoeba in the water in those places in the world where uh, human sewage mixes with the sources of drinking water. Let's imagine uh, that uh, uh, I had an amoebic dysentery, which I don't, but let's imagine that I did. So I've got all these amoeba in my intestinal tract, and when one uh, has a bowel movement, when one defecates into the toilet, so there are these amoeba in the stool, in the feces. Uh, somebody flushes the toilet and uh, travels down a sewer line. There are places in this world where, uh, it, rather than the uh, human sewage when you flush the toilet, rather than it going to a sewage treatment plant, instead it just uh, is, goes down a sewer line and it's released directly into a lake or a river, untreated. So that means there's now amoeba uh, as well as the human sewage, uh, being released into a uh, source of drinking water, a large lake or a river. So then, when you turn on the tap and you have a glass of water, inside that water are uh, a, a amoebic, uh, the amoeba that causes amoebic dysentery, and when you drink it, uh, you will then introduce these microscopic amoeba into your body, and next thing you know, you will have very severe diarrhea. So this is really the story that you, many of you have heard of, that you have to be careful with certain places in the world about drinking the water. Uh, the way I always solve this whenever I travel is I almost never drink uh, the water in any place I travel to. I simply always drink beer because all beer is pasteurized, uh, it is heated, it, it's, uh, it kills all the uh, bad guys that are in the water, and besides it's a lot more fun to drink beer than it is to drink water anyhow. Uh, let's take a look at page uh, J6. On J6, uh, you can uh, draw a picture of an amoeba. Uh, you'll remember that we have amoeba uh, to look at in the laboratory, and I've made a video uh, that's linked on my website, uh, uh, that's uh, on, posted on YouTube, uh, where all the microscopes and all the slides that we want you to look at, you can watch a, a video of all these uh, uh, on the uh, YouTube video. So we've asked you to draw a picture of some of the uh, amoeba 
And these are the good old regular nice amoeba that live in pond water, not the one that causes amoebic dysentery. But uh, we've asked you to draw a picture of it under high power magnification. And uh, on page J7, we've asked you to estimate about how big these amoeba are on J7. Now, a second class of, uh, of uh, protozoans that we want to talk about are the flagellated protozoans uh, that we're calling class Trypanosoma. And there are many, many members in this class, many species. Uh, they, may have, they might have one flagellum, they might have three flagella, they might have many, many flagella. The specific one that we want to talk about, though, is a flagellated uh, protozoan Tripan that's in the class Trypanosoma, that uh, actually is responsible for uh, a disease in humans known as African sleeping sickness. Now, this is a flagellated protozoan. It looks like this, and it lives in our blood. You can see in this picture, here are some red blood cells, and under the microscope, we can see these snake-like uh, Trypanosoma with their flagellum, and they're able to swim around and they feed on red blood cells. As they feed on red blood cells, that makes somebody weak. And the reason why they become weak when these red blood cells are destroyed is it causes a type of anemia. Anemia means, uh, is the term we use whenever somebody has a decreased number of normal red blood cells. And so the person is becoming anemic. And since the role of red blood cells is to carry oxygen uh, to the uh, various cells of our body, they have a reduced ability in this person with these uh, fewer and fewer red blood cells being, uh, as they're destroyed by these uh, 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 parasites. Uh, they are less able to carry uh, oxygen in the bloodstream and the person gets very weak because they can't produce energy uh, uh, at the normal rate without that oxygen because cellular respiration requires oxygen. Uh, now, the question, next question is, how do you get this disease? How do you, how do you contract this uh, uh, flagellated protozoan called trypanosoma? And the answer is that it's actually transmitted by a fly. Now, there's a term that we use when uh, an organism, uh, an animal, commonly an insect, is involved in transmitting a disease. It's not that the insect causes the disease, but the insect, in this case, is acting to transfer the disease from one person to another. And the term we use is it's a vector. A vector is uh, an animal, an organism, that transfers uh, a, a parasite, uh, a cause of the disease, from one person to another. Let's imagine that I had this uh, parasite in my bloodstream. Now, a number of uh, female insects, including female flies and female mosquitoes, uh, will bite people or other uh, animals uh, to get blood uh, just to provide additional nourishment that the female needs before it can lay its eggs. Most of the time, this being bitten by a mosquito or being bitten by a fly is a nuisance. It causes some irritation, uh, but it's usually nothing overly serious. But let's imagine that I've got this parasite in my blood, and the fly bites me, and as it draws up some of my blood, uh, it also draws up some of this parasite. Let's imagine this uh, fly now has this parasite in its pouch, in its body, and it flies around and bites somebody else, uh, and somebody who did not have this parasite in their bloodstream. Well, now, as it bites somebody else who did not have this parasite, it may act to transfer some of these, uh, the parasite into the bloodstream of somebody who previously did not have this uh, parasite in them. So, uh, in fact, on page J8, on J8 at the top, so uh, in the uh, photograph at the top left on J8, uh, we see an actual photograph of blood and these, uh, the round cells are red blood cells, uh, some of which I've colored red. And these snake-like things are the uh, flagellated protozoan called trypanosoma. Now, there are medications that one can take if one has this uh, disease. Uh, and you can see that uh, in this photograph here, the person was given the medication and it did kill the parasite. 
So now we understand why it was called uh, African sleeping sickness, uh, by destroying uh, red blood cells, making the person anemic, it makes them weak and tired all the time, and it is primarily found in Africa, uh, transmitted by a, a fly. And uh, right below these pictures on J8, uh, so we talk about the role of a vector on uh, J8 in transmitting the disease. Now, I mentioned some other flagellated protozoans. Uh, there is another flagellated protozoan that can cause, that can, that can actually uh, uh, live and cause irritation in the vaginal canal or birth canal of women. Uh, it's not that common in this country, but occasionally women do contract it. Uh, the name of the parasite is Trichomonas vaginalis. You actually have a picture of it. I'm not asking you to know it, but on page J9, uh, you can see pictured on the top left of J9 is Trichomonas vaginalis. And again, there are uh, medications that one can take to uh, kill this uh, parasite. <clears throat> on page uh, J10, on J10, the third class of protozoans that we want to speak of are those that move by cilia, motile hairs, uh, and we will call them class paramecium. A paramecium is an extraordinarily complex uh, single-celled organism uh, it is characterized uh, by having these cilia all over it, and these cilia move, and that allows it to move in pond water, and that's usually where they live is in pond water. Uh, you'll notice that it has a, a, an oral, uh, a cytostome, which is like a, a mouth, and uh, it even has an anal pore to eliminate waste products. Extraordinarily complex for one cell. Uh, it is characterized also by having a large macronucleus, kind of in the shape of a kidney bean or lima bean, and a very small, round micronucleus. Uh, and uh, this is very characteristic of paramecium. <clears throat> Incidentally, you'll also notice that they possess contractile vacuoles, because since they live in pond water, they have the same problem or challenge that the amoeba have that live in pond water. Water tends to flow into them, and if something doesn't correct or compensate for this accumulation of water flowing in, uh, they would swell up and burst, if not for these contractile vacuoles that accumulate this water that's flowing in, and they contract and squirt the water out. Uh, at the bottom of the page, it shows a picture of two paramecium doing uh, the closest thing that paramecium can do uh, to sex. Uh, two paramecium will come side by side. Here you can see the macronucleus. This is one paramecium and their little round micronucleus. Here's the other paramecium with its large macronucleus and micronucleus. And they come side by side and they will actually exchange micronuclei. So the micronuclei will be exchanged between them. Uh, this creates a genetic diversity or ch uh, changes in genetic makeup of these uh, paramecium. And this process is called conjugation. And it comes from a Latin root con, meaning together. Uh, they come together and they exchange micro micronuclei. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, on page J11, on J11, there's a place on J11 for you to draw a picture of a paramecium that you see under a microscope. And again, I want to remind you that we have a special video linked on my website uh, where you can see images of all of these in a YouTube video. And again, we've asked you to estimate how big uh, the paramecium are to compare them in size to a, uh, an amoeba. On the next page, uh, J12, uh, you can see there are many, many other types of ciliated paramecium. Uh, on J12, each of these classes of protozoans has thousands of species, thousands of members, and we are simply sh uh, examining one or two examples in each of these categories. But they all have uh, cilia. On page uh, J13, the fourth and last class 
of uh, protozoans are the non-motile protozoans, and we're calling them plasmodium. Uh, we're calling them plasmodium after the most famous member of this uh, class, uh, the member that causes, causes malaria. Uh, and uh, we did mention that since they don't move, uh, none of these members in this class of protozoans move. All of them are parasites. They all cause disease. We're just mentioning or identifying the one that is most responsible for causing actually more deaths worldwide than any other parasite, uh, even causing more deaths than HIV, the HIV virus that causes AIDS, is the uh, malarial parasite. And uh, malaria is really a disease found uh, in many, many places in the world. It's found through much of Latin America, uh, including Central America and South America. It's found in Africa, it's found in, in India, it's found in uh, Southeast Asia, and uh, in the Philippines, in Vietnam, in Cambodia, uh, and uh, many other places. So uh, it's quite widespread. And the World Health Organization of the United Nations uh, identifies malaria as the major uh, killer of, of people in the world. Uh, now, uh, the malarial parasite itself is a very small cell, and uh, very interestingly, as you can see in this picture, uh, it, uh, it's a very small cell, and it has a nucleus, and the nucleus is kind of not in the center, but kind of offset on the side. And it kind of gives the appearance, when you look at it, of looking like a ring with a birthstone. And so they call it a ring shape. It's not, uh, it's obviously a cell with a nucleus, but when you look at it, it kind of looks like a ring. So they talk about a ring shape. Now, this parasite enters, it lives in the human blood, it enters red blood cells, and it multiplies inside the red blood cells, as you can see in this picture. It divides, multiplying, and then at a certain point, they burst out of the red blood cell. And as they burst out, the person who has this parasite will experience very high fevers and chills. And uh, this, uh, these uh, parasites will burst out of the red blood cell and then enter new red blood cells. And then typically, over the next 24 hours, they will again reproduce. And 24 hours later, they will burst out of the red blood cells, creating another episode of high fevers and chills. And that's very characteristic of malaria, is these 24-hour uh, cycles of uh, high fevers and chills created every time these parasites burst out of the red blood cells and enter new red blood cells. Now, the obvious question is, uh, how do you get malaria? How do you contract this parasite? Where does it come from? As in the case of Trypanosoma, which was transmitted by the African tsetse fly acting as a vector, a, a, an organism of transmission, uh, in this case, uh, an Anopheles, a female Anopheles mosquito is the uh, agent of transfer. It is the vector. So again, imagine if uh, I had uh, malaria, which I don't, but uh, if I did, and this parasite was in my blood, uh, then when the mosquito bit me, it would draw up some of the blood, including some of the parasite. And then if it bit somebody else who did not have malaria, in so doing, it might act to transmit that malarial parasite called plasmodium to uh, the person who previously did not have uh, this parasite. This is why in those places in the world where there is the malarial parasite, uh, and there's also a lot of mosquitoes, people go to sleep surrounded by a mosquito netting, and uh, they use insecticides to kill the mosquito. Uh, if, again, it's not the mosquito causing the disease, but killing the mosquito, eradicating the mosquitoes, uh, reduces the spread or transmission of the parasite, the protozoan that actually causes the disease. Uh, and uh, again, this makes, uh, as the blood red blood cells are destroyed, it makes somebody very, very weak, and uh, it can, the can, person can die from it. Even when uh, they take medication, and there are medications that uh, kill the parasite, uh, there is no medication that absolutely cures the person. 
So in fact, if somebody has ever had malaria, uh, they uh, will not accept them as a blood donor. So uh, they cannot donate blood because there's always the possibility that that parasite still remains in their blood, uh, still remains in their body, and even if they hadn't had an episode of fevers and chills for many, many years, uh, it can uh, return back because the parasite can lie dormant in the body and then be, uh, in a sense, uh, become active again. Okay, so that's the malarial parasite. Let's uh, summarize uh, the four classes of uh, protozoans uh, that we've been talking about. Uh, so as we said earlier, there are four classes based on how they move. Class amoeba, class trypanosoma, uh, amoeba moved by pseudopodia, the trypanosoma by flagella. The trypanosoma, we said, is the one that causes African sleeping sickness. The paramecium, which moved by means of cilia, and plasmodium, which are non-motile, they don't move, is the cause of malaria. <clears throat> we want to uh, finish off by mentioning two other phyla of, uh, in Kingdom Protista, and this is phylum diatoms and phylum dinoflagellates. Now, uh, we've indicated here that both of these phyla are algae. And by algae, uh, we mean that they carry on photosynthesis. Let's uh, enlarge that a little bit when we wrote that. So uh, these are uh, aquatic uh, photosynthetic organisms, simple photosynthetic organisms. They contain chlorophyll. They make their own food by carrying on photosynthesis. So what's the difference then between diatoms and dinoflagellates? So we wrote that the diatoms uh, cannot move, they just float in the water, and in fact they are the most abundant living things in the ocean, uh, and they are commonly referred to as plankton. They are one of the main organisms that contributes to these microscopic uh, living things in the ocean, collectively called plankton. Uh, the phy phylum dinoflagellates, as the name suggests, they have a flagellum. And so, yes, they do carry on photosynthesis, but they can move. And they tend to swim towards the surface of the water where they live, towards where there's sunlight. Let's take a look at uh, both of these. Uh, on page uh, J, uh, first off on uh, J14, on J14, we mentioned at the top the photosynthetic algae. And uh, in the lab manual, I talk about three uh, groups, three phyla, uh, the euglena, as well as the diatoms and dinoflagellates. But we're just going to focus on the diatoms and dinoflagellates, which are listed right here. Now, the technical names for these phylum is phylum chrysophyta and phylum uh, paraphyta, but we'll accept the names diatoms and dinoflagellates. On J15, on J15, I'm sorry, J16, on J16 are pictures of diatoms. Now, uh, diatoms, when you look at them under the microscope, they're going to look like little pieces of cut glass. And that's because they all have an outer cell wall, an outer cell wall made up of silica, the same uh, substance that makes glass. Uh, so they're glass-like, they have a glass-like cell wall. And it's almost like snowflakes, uh, there's almost like no two that are absolutely identical. Uh, they are found in, uh, in, in uh, not only the oceans, uh, the most abundant living things in the ocean, but also freshwater lakes. And their importance is that they form the base of the food chain. Now you'd say, what's a food chain? So a food chain is the order in which living things feed on one another. And uh, in this picture, in this picture, it shows these microscopic diatoms, let's say floating in the ocean, and it shows a copepod, which are small shrimp that feed on the diatoms, and then it shows a sardine that feeds on the copepods, and then it shows a bird that feeds on the sardines, or maybe we draw a picture of you eating a sardine, or some other larger fish feeding on the sardine. 
But where did the food chain, where did this chain begin? It began with these photosynthetic plant-like organisms that float in the water, called diatoms. Now, uh, there's another picture of these diatoms on J17. And again, they're really quite stunningly pretty, uh, looking like uh, different types of snowflakes, as it were. Incidentally, if you're familiar with swimming pools, the uh, powder that they put, put into swimming pool filters is known as diatomaceous earth because it's really just uh, crushed up diatoms and be they take advantage of the fact that this outer cell wall is made up of glass, a glass-like material, and it acts as a filter material uh, to filter swimming pools uh, and keep them clean. It's also used as a polishing agent. Uh, because it creates a very fine grit uh, that can be used for polishing, but doesn't uh, cause severe scratching. Okay, so much for uh, the diatoms. Uh, our last phylum that we're going to examine on J18 uh, are the dinoflagellates. Now again, these are algae. These uh, carry on photosynthesis. They are autotrophs. Uh, they uh, do have chlorophyll inside them, but uh, they get the name dinoflagellates because they have a flagellum, and that allows them to move. <clears throat> now, uh, the one that we're going to focus on that we have uh, slides of, and it's on this video as well, uh, is this dinoflagellate right here because this is the one that's found uh, right off the uh, coast in the Pacific uh, Ocean, especially around Baja, uh, California, but it's also found uh, uh, also found uh, in southern, off the coast of uh, Southern California. And uh, uh, so that's the one we'll take a look at uh, in the lab. Now, occasionally, the numbers of dinoflagellates increases uh, to a very high amount in the ocean. And uh, when they reach uh, extremely high numbers in the ocean, uh, they actually produce chemicals that can actually cause fish to die. And this is known as a red tide. Now, don't confuse a red tide condition with a riptide condition. A riptide is when there's a strong undertow because of uh, ocean currents uh, that can, uh, if you go out into the ocean, it can pull you out further and further. That's called a riptide. But a red tide condition is when the water starts to change color. It may or may not necessarily become actually red, but it's really due to massive numbers of these dinoflagellates accumulating in the ocean. And uh, they will also tell people not to go out into the ocean at that time uh, when that's present. Now, some of these dinoflagellates are, as we wrote at the bottom paragraph on J18, some of these dinoflagellates are bioilluminescent. And that means they will glow, they illuminate, they give off light at night. And uh, they, uh, some of you who have been especially maybe down to Baja, California in the summer, uh, in the warm summer months, as you look at the uh, ocean water around the Baja, California, you may see it kind of glowing blue. And if you take some of the wet sand, which has these dinoflagellates uh, in the wet sand, and throw it, it'll flash kind of a blue light. Uh, really very interesting and uh, uh, fun to watch. So uh, we have talked about uh, the two, two phylum of algae. Again, in summarizing, in summarizing then Kingdom Protista, we've talked about uh, these four classes of, uh, in phylum protozoa and two uh, phylum of photosynthetic uh, King, uh, protus, uh, the diatoms, which just float in the water, and the dinoflagellates, which actually move in the water because they have a flagellum. Let's take a look now also at uh, page J20. On J20, we'll, we're going to summarize what we've been learning in another way on this diagram on J20. So I'm, I'm uh, holding this. Uh, oriented this uh, page J20 horizontally. And here's what we see it says. Uh, all single-celled organisms. So 
Uh, the major kingdoms that contain single-celled organisms are Kingdom Monera and Kingdom Protista. Although we will see there are some single-celled organisms in the fu Kingdom Fungi and the Plant Kingdom. Uh, the, all these single-celled organisms that have, lack a nucleus that are prokaryotes are placed in Kingdom Monera. And we further subdivided them into the heterotrophic phylum bacteria and the auto, autotrophic or photosynthetic phylum blue-green algae. Kingdom Protista, as well as the single-celled organisms uh, that are in the other kingdoms, have a nucleus. They possess a nucleus. They're eukaryotes. And, uh, but focusing on Kingdom Protista, we divided the Kingdom Protista into the heterotrophic phylum protozoa. That means they feed on other things, sometimes on non-living stuff, sometimes on us as parasites. And uh, we divided the phylum protozoa into four classes based upon their motility or how they move. That. So uh, this, those that move by means of pseudopodia or false feet, uh, we placed in uh, what we called uh, class amoeba. Now the real name for it is Sarcodyna, but uh, we ca we're calling it amoeba because uh, that's the most familiar organism or member of that class. Uh, those that move by means of cilia are cla called class ciliata, and the most prominent member of that is paramecia. Then there were those that move by means of a tail or flagellum. Their technical name is class mastigophora, but we called them trypanosoma after the very uh, it, it, uh, infamous member that causes African sleeping sickness. And the fourth and last class of phylum protozoa were the non-motile parasites. All of them are parasites. And uh, their technical name is class Sporozoa, but we refer to them as Plasmodium after the most famous member or infamous member that causes malaria. And then finally, uh, 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 in Kingdom Protista, we have those that are, uh, have uh, chlorophyll and carry on photosynthesis. These uh, are autotrophs. They are also known as algae. Now, we, in the lab manual, we actually identified three phylum. Uh, but uh, I only am holding you responsible for two of the three. Uh, there are the non-motile diatoms, technically called phylum chrysophyta, we'll call them phylum diatoms, that just float in the water and uh, are the makeup comprised most of what we call the floating plankton in the ocean, which is the beginning of the food chain in the ocean. Uh, and then there are the flagellated uh, euglena, which we didn't talk about, and the flagellated dinoflagellates. Uh, and obviously, because they possess flagella, they can move. So that summarizes most of the single-celled organisms that we're going to be learning about. And uh, we now understand the distinction between Kingdom Monera and Kingdom Protista. One last, one last comment that we'll make. Uh, we have, in both Kingdom Monera and Kingdom Protista, animal-like and plant-like organisms, uh, heterotrophs and autotrophs. So what was the reason why we placed uh, uh, heterotrophic bacteria and autotrophic blue-green algae in this Kingdom Monera? And the answer was they are single-celled and lack a nucleus. They are prokaryotes. And why did we include uh, the uh, heterotrophic protozoans that feed on other things? Uh, with the uh, algae, these plant-like uh, single-celled organisms, the diatoms and the dinoflagellates, uh, we said what they have in common is they are single-celled organisms and have a nucleus. They are eukaryotes and single-celled. So that's why uh, those kingdoms contain both uh, autotrophs as well as heterotrophs. Uh, that concludes uh, our, the introduction to Kingdom Protista. And again, I want to remind you that uh, we have a video of all of these guys that you can watch on the website. Let's go to it right now on the website. So if you scroll down on the website to where it says Professor Fink's Review of Kingdom Monera and Kingdom uh, Protista, and we click on it, And you'll be able to see examples 
of all these, and uh, you can test yourself on these, starting with Kingdom Monera, violet blue green algae, and uh, here's what they look like. And we ask you to uh, remember whether it's prokaryotic or eukaryotic. It is prokaryotic. Notice the cells have no nucleus in them. And then uh, here's some examples of uh, King, uh, Kingdom Monera bacteria. This was the Staphylococcus, a cluster of coccus-shaped bacteria that causes what are known as staph infections of the skin. Anyhow, you can uh, take a look at the rest of these. You'll see, uh, you'll see other images of, here's that snake-like uh, trypanosoma that causes African sleeping sickness. And you'll see here's uh, two paramecium that are conjugating. That's where they exchange micronuclei with each other. Anyhow, you should review all this on the video.